A very warm welcome to all of you who are joining in person at St. Thomas Church and online the first of these uh, bicentennial historical uh, lectures. We are really excited um, to begin them uh, with a uh, an exceptional speaker. Speaker, really, we are very, very grateful that uh, he has accepted to join our conversation, although because he is in uh, Minneapolis, he um, uh, he had to uh, give his lecture on Zoom. And incidentally, I myself uh, am in Chicago for a conference right now. So I am uh, introducing a speaker from um, from Chicago. Uh, so the uh, speaker today, Professor John Butler, is the Howard Lamar Emeritus Professor of American Studies, History and Religious Studies at Yale University. And, um, you know, I, I could go on for a long time to list uh, his achievements and publications. There is a real, there's a full page um, uh, about him in, uh, uh, in his uh, profile uh, at Yale University. The only book I really want to mention is one which has had a profound impact on me, uh, is God in Gotham, The Miracle of Religion in Manhattan, which has been published um, two or three years ago, I think, uh, and which I warmly, warmly recommend to all of you to try to understand Christianity in New York. For me, it has been uh, immensely um, eye-opening. It has revealed to me the extent to which New York, far from being um, a, um, a challenge uh, uh, or an obstacle to the thriving of Christianity, has, has, has um, contributed to uh, an incredible flourishing uh, theologically and pastorally and socially when it comes to Christianity. So the topic of um, Professor John Butler's uh, lecture is um, a focus on 1905, the uh, infamous uh, burning of St. Thomas and the crisis of religion in modern Manhattan. Thank you so much, Professor John Butler. And I hand, it over, I hand over the microphone, <laughs> the screen to you. Thank you for such a nice, generous introduction. And yes, I am talking to you from Minneapolis, where if you look see out my study window, uh, it looks like we have a lot of great snow, but in fact, we're having the same snowless winter that you're having in New York or that uh, uh, that uh, Chicago is having. So we're sort of having a pathetic uh, winter in, in Minnesota, even though it might look like we're having actual snow. So um, I'm really honored to speak here this morning. And I want to talk to you about St. Thomas Church, and but mainly about the context in which the members of the congregation and the leaders of the Episcopal Church and of St. Thomas might have found themselves, did find themselves in 1905. So in 1905, the church experienced an utter disaster. It was the second time that its uh, building had been destroyed by fire. The earlier occurred after the Civil War. And um, this happened, you can see on the, if you're looking on this, in your screen, ideally uh, you'll see the headline from a now long since disappeared New York City newspaper called the Evening Telegram, in which St. Thomas Church, the center, center of a social world, which, uh, was a headline that referred to, um, well, you see the subheadline, uh, it refers to the church as fashionable, a fashionable church, was destroyed by flames. Um, and the fire was just in, enormously, uh, enormously destructive. Uh, you can see in this uh, not great photo, uh, but one that we have, just how what was left of the building. The building was an utter disaster. Um, it was, when, when, they, when they say it was destroyed by flames, they weren't kidding. Um, this was really a, an amazing fire. And it was remarkable that no one was killed in this fire. So, um, but the, what was left of the church was really, um, uh, let's go right here. 
here's what here's what the, the shell of the of the church was this uh comes from this photograph and then you can see here uh this kind of one one picture of these men working to uh scoop out the remains of the building and then to try to start anew the difficulty uh, that St. Thomas faced was not its own. The difficulty that it faced as well is that the fire occurred in the, amidst a 30-year crisis in re, what, what could be called religion, a 30-year crisis in, re, in Christianity, a 30-year crisis in Protestantism, in Catholicism, and in the stature and performance of Judaism in America, in, in the city, I'm sorry, um, from the 1870s into the 1910s, because uh, the, the city faced a major problem in that led, that came from a number of important features about the nature of religion in, and the setting of religion in the mid and late 19th century. And the first problem was urbanization. That is the development of the city as, as, a, as, a, uh, as, as a, uh, whoops, here. The development of the city as a massive place in which the, face, the loss of rural face-to-face -face community has been uh, enormous. And this gives you a, a, a view of the Manhattan uh, uh, as early as 1851. And you'll see uh, that uh, uh, there are Protestant church spires here and there, mostly Protestant church spires here and there. But you'll see that what, what happened here is that there is no longer the possibility of small town face-to-face -face religiosity or life in, in this kind of a city, the kind of, of atmosphere in which Christianity had grown up for centuries since, since the birth of Jesus, since the development of the early Roman Catholic Church, since the development of the medieval period. Uh, yes, there were cities, but they were all rel relatively small, 40, 50, 60,000 people at the most. Uh, but most people, 90%, 95% of your population, and 80 to 90 percent of America's population by the 18 by the by the Civil War still lived in rural areas where the, they knew who lived where, what did they do, what where, where did they go to, what kind of a what kind of religion did they have, and this was not possible in this in this kind of an urban setting. So uh, it it really meant that uh, uh, that had disappeared. And the question is, what happens to religiosity? What happens to faith? What happens to uh, the, the nature of belief in this kind of an at, at abstract uh, quality of life? The second uh, quality that happened that really threatened religion was what's called, what historians call modernization. This really meant the rise of scientific explanation, uh, the loss of biblical supremacy, the rise of the so-called higher criticism that subjected the scriptures to deep interpretation and a lot of questions about who wrote which book, which book is more faithful to say the words of Jesus, uh, which book is more faithful or which book is more or less faithful to what Christianity should be an exposure of the difficulties in the scriptures, the inconsistencies of the scriptures, uh, all occurred largely in the 19th century through European scholarship, but also through American scholarship. So that the, 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 the Bible was now a contested area of life, not an area of life on, that, was, that could be the easy foundation for any religious group and, and uh, much less for the, for the nation. Uh, and then there is the beco becoming the rise of giant corporations, the rise of bureaucracies, both in business life and in government. So in, as, as um, American society developed 
over the period from the Civil War, say to 1900, say to 1910s, or, or say to what was called the, the Great War, the First World War, uh, the nature of the way that government operated, the way that businesses operated changed dramatically. And uh, that the bureaucratization of life went hand in hand with sort of the mo modernism of life, the development of modern notions about how to run corporations, where people would, would fit in. All of this really uh, creates problems for uh, the nature of, of religiosity. And it was very, all of this was summarized by, in 1917, by a speech that the great German sociologist Max Weber gave in Munich, uh, describing what he said uh, was the, uh, uh, the disenchantment of the world. That is that the world, the formerly uh, world of miracles, of wonders, of spirits, of simple belief, had been wiped away by urbanization, had been wiped away by bureaucratization, had been wiped away by uh, the, uh, biblical criticism, and uh, this the, the world was now dis disenchanted, no longer an enchanted place. It was a disenchanted world, and so there this this leads to uh, difficulty, and. Um, the third really real crisis, um, if we can uh, uh, sort of make this work, uh, here we go, re uh, re uh, <laughs> re resides in pluralism. And I'm showing you here a cartoon from the humor magazine Puck. It was published in the United States and the, uh, the cartoon is from 1879, so it's relatively early. But you'll notice that uh, it's, it's, it's a satire on the nature of religiosity in America and the, and, and the, the, the and in a way, the, the blooming of so many varieties. In other words, one of the two things are happening here. One is that the world is no longer enchanted, and yet there are more and more religious groups to compete with each other to uh, provide a kind of religiosity for the nature for, for those who do wish to believe. And they, they, they can believe in many different ways. And we can start here at the left with the, on the left, upper, upper left in, uh, with uh, a Baptist. And then of course, here we have the, the, this is the Episcopal minister, the Episcopal ritual of salvation. That is the, the charge by the cartoonist that the Episcopal church is a church of ritual. And then we have the Mormons with polygamy, and then we have the Methodists over here, and they and 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 they they can your body sings. Methodists are famous for singing, and then another kind of baptism, and and then uh, uh, and then a series of of, of figures uh, here ending up with a Catholic bishop, where who is just collecting money, and we have the Presbyterian synods over here. And on the left, over here, we have uh, a Mohel who is uh, preparing for a circumcision, okay? And so the, the, the point is, is that amidst bureaucratization and amidst uh, uh, the decline in uh, simple belief in the, in the Bible, uh, and the growth of bureaucracies and whatnot, we have religious chaos. And that's the point of the uh, that's the point of the cartoon. That is that the notion here is that uh, rather than a, a a a unified kind of religiosity, uh, we have just utter chaos. Any kind of religion, anything goes. And the puck cartoonist knew perfectly well uh, uh, that that he or she, but in this case a he. Uh, uh, was only selecting some of the re religions available in the United States, and so the, if you if you look at the at, on, on the, in the on the tent here, uh, uh, the, the 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 it says the arcade of true faith. Take your choice, okay. And so the question is here: either on the one hand you have a you have a uh, the the loss of a kind of certainty of religion. And, uh, and that loss of certainty 
is sort of magnified by the multiplicity of religions available to Americans uh, in the nineteen in in the as the nineteenth century progresses. Then there's religion in New York City, and so we what we're going to do here is we're going to go down to the next slide and say. Um, uh, uh, we should we should look here at a, at a book by Samuel Lane Loomis, who happened to be uh, a congregational minister in Brooklyn, and he wrote a book in 1887 called Modern Cities and the Religious Problems. And what was he writing about? He was really writing about just what I've explained, but especially in cities, the crisis of religiosity. In late, late 19th century America was not so not so much a rural problem, a small town problem, a small city problem. It was the problem of modern cities. By by the late 1890s, New York City was having a, more than a million people. Uh, there was life was anonymous, and uh, Loomis be, began uh, trying to sort out. How would we begin to solve this problem of religiosity in the city when more and more people uh, were really not uh, believing? And as a year later, what we have is uh, a conference dedicated to the religious condition of New York City. A uh, conference in 1888. Uh, it was a conference of Protestants, uh, including Protestants from the Episcopal Church. The Congregational Church, the Lutheran Church, every every almost all major Protestant denominations, Baptists uh, as well, uh, all participated in this conference. And the conference, there were some some uh, speakers who saw hope for the city, but most of the speeches given and that were published in this book called "The Religious Condition of New York City" read like funeral statements that New York was really in bad shape and that Manhattan especially was in bad shape, not only not just in lower Manhattan, which was in the worst possible shape by 1888 from their perspective, but uh, was uh, uh, that the, the spread throughout the city. What were, what were the problems? The problems dealt with in part with the lack of religious opportunities in the city. Uh, that is, they noticed, for example, they counted, they were already, so you're getting, you're sort of getting a modern view of, of things. They were already into numeracy and counting things and they could count uh, that there, that saloons outnumbered congregations of any kind, even those that they didn't want. <laughs> saloons outnumbered in most New York Area saloons could easily out in a, in, a, in in a given residential area could outnumber uh, congregations by ratios of three hundred and four hundred to one, so that for every congregation there were three or four or in some areas even five hundred saloons. Saloons were every every third or fourth business on a New York City block, and uh, so so the, the city was seen. As a as a uh, as a as a squalid, uh, sinful area. In addition, and this was fitted with the nature of the of tenements, so that the tenements were dark, lacked lacked lighting. Uh, ministers who tried to uh, one minister, a Lutheran minister who tried to uh, work in a tenement building to go from from apartment to apartment. To, to try to ask people would they like to come to church, where might they be interested in going, et cetera. You know, this described how the building was so dark on the inside that he almost he almost stepped on a young girl who was sitting in the stairway and he didn't see her. And uh, he very near he could have killed her uh, by stepping too hard, but he she screamed and and he managed to avoid her. And uh, but the, he used that incident as uh, a, a way of trying to describe how it is that, um, that, that the city 
was really pre pre prevent, presenting an enormous challenge to the future of, not only the future of Christianity, not only the future of Protestantism, not only the future of the Episcopal Church, but the, but, but the or, or Judaism or Catholicism, it presented a problem to the future of religion. It, the, the problem was enormously wide. And um, and 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 it was and it was um, really rolling over again and again. Uh, and what were they? What were they going to do? Uh, the different. So 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 now, if we have so um, if this is this, this is the context in which twenty almost twenty years later, the the fire at St. Thomas Church really was a conflagration. Uh, in a peculiar kind of way was after 1900, or only five years after the, in the into the new century, a kind of a testament to the problems of religiosity in the city itself. Okay, the question is, how do we get from the fire of St. Thomas and the crises of the 1880s, the 1890s, the early 1900s, the religious crisis that the conference, that the 1888 New York City conference uh, presented to the world, how do we get to that? To by the 1930s, New York City was a kind of spiritual hothouse. New York's religion was flourishing in New York City. It was booming. And so how, what happens between the 1890s and the 1920s and 30s that could possibly make that happen? And uh, why is it that by the, by 1940, New York City had more well-known theologians than any other place in America, any other city, any other state, any other region was incomparable. And we'll come to that at the end of the talk. So how could this happen? Well, it happens for a very simple, in a way, very simple way. And that is, um, Religion, religious groups, rather than rejecting modernization, accepted and embraced modernization in many different parts. And I'll try to describe for you how that happened. Among other things, through new modes of financing, modern modes of financing, they stuffed the city with sanctuaries. So most of you who are in New York will know that if you walk down any, almost any, of the numbered streets in the city, walk down any of them and start counting the number of congregations that you find on almost all New York City's numbered streets, from Lower Manhattan all the way up to pa past past Harlem. And uh, so, so in not just one or two, but oftentimes three, four, or five congregations, most of them constructed between the 1880s and the 1930s. Congregations prospered, denominations flourished, uh, Manhattan became a major publishing center for religion, and then it became a kind of Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish theological hothouse. Um, and above all, uh, the organized organized religion really prospered in the city from the 1880s through the 1930s. And the reconstruction of St. Thomas is a testament in, a, in its own way to the prosperity of religion in the city. So that by the time the new St. Thomas was opened, 10 years, roughly 10 years after the fire, it, it was a it was a harbinger of the kind of prosperity that organized religion would find in the city in the 1920s, 30s, despite the depression, and the 1940s, up into the 1950s. So uh, let's uh, see if we can figure out, well, how might this have, have happened? Uh, one of the things that, that uh, 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 one, of the, one of the things that, um, uh, that happened is that all the denominations, some more, some earlier than others, but by the 1920s, all of them, whether they be Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish, embraced 
modern methods in church work or synagogue work, when I have it, that, which was the title of a book published as early as 1897 by George White Whitfield Mead. And what were the modern methods? They meant training. They meant train, greater training for clergy, better training for, for uh, ch all churches needed, needed modern financial accounting, modern financial means of raising money, asking people for money, systematic giving, uh, not just casual giving, but systematic giving, and uh, organizing uh, organizations within a congregation, uh, having those organizations inside a congregation multiply literary societies, uh, church societies, women's societies, men's societies. Whereas in the early 19th century, uh, the, the, these were really uh, very uncommon, say in 1820 or 1830. By the 1910s, uh, it was common for there to be multiple organizations inside every kind of congregation, whether it be the Catholic Catholic parishes, whether it be Episcopal parishes, congregational churches, Baptist Baptist churches, or or Jewish synagogues. Everywhere the the organization these organizations multiplied, and they were all seen not as a threat to congregational life. But as a boon to congregational life, they brought people inside the buildings. Uh, they brought people uh, everywhere inside to, in, and participated in worship. If they participated in a men's group, if they participated in a literary society, if they participated in an adolescent group, then they also participated in worship. And so the, these modern methods uh, could work. And uh, they not only not only did they did they pertain to uh, I'm sorry, not only did they pertain to uh, 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 to church methods even, uh, generally, but they even pertained to Sunday school work. Sunday school became, Sunday schools became part of this product process of modernization, by especially by training Sunday school teachers. This was a process that had started uh, just before the Civil War and then accelerated just afterwards, but it really took off after the 1890s, when the same minister, George Whitfield Mead, also wrote a book in 1905 called Modern Methods in Sunday School Work. So he not only brought modern methods, I advocated modern methods to, um, to church life generally, but even to Sunday school, which you might think, oh, just innocent little children and you just go in and teach them. That wasn't his view at all. Uh, all Sunday school teachers needed to be trained. They needed to, they needed to take what was the equivalent of kind of a co college training uh, in Sunday school work, and uh, and and it uh, and it and it um, really um, um, exemplified the kind of the, the kind of um, emphasis on modernization that overtook all. All and to their benefit, all virtually all religious groups in the city. Then, in addition, also uh, uh, the denomination stuffed the city with sanctuaries. Uh, there were the most prominent, of course, were giant sanctuaries like like um, uh, Saint Patrick's Cathedral, um, um, which which was um, which was organized, which was. Um, uh, uh, opened in 1885. And even though here, here this is a cutoff view from Harper's Magazine of a funeral, at, uh, just as the, uh, the same year that the congregation was, that the building was dedicated, here, here's a funeral. And the, the drawing admittedly accentuates the, the giantism of St. Patrick's. Uh, uh, to which the, to which the, First, the, the church, uh, uh, St. Thomas Church, that was built uh, after the Civil War that burned down in 1905 was a smaller version of the large New York City congregation. St. Patrick's was the epitome of what it meant to be an enormous uh, um, sanctuary. But there were all kinds of sanctuaries. Uh, and uh, there were modest churches. And then there were uh, uh, congregations that rented space. 
So here, if you look right here in the center of the picture, and you can see uh, this, this, this sign on the second floor of this building, just the very center of the picture, what you'll see is that that is a sign that identifies what was called the Lemberger Shevra, uh, a Jewish congregation, one of, one of hundreds of tiny Jewish congregations of 10, 15, or 20 members that met in the second floor rooms of a New York City uh, apartment building on Attorney Street in Lower Manhattan. And um, the photographer just happened, happened to take a picture of this. It wasn't his, it wasn't the photographer's intention, I believe, uh, to take a picture of the Lemberger Chevra uh, sign or building. But here you get a notion that, uh, what, what was the advantage here? These were rented facilities. So religious groups met in all kinds of rented facilities uh, that were, um, that, that gave a lot of flexibility to um, religious expression in the city. You can, they couldn't, these people couldn't build St. Pat's Cathedral. They couldn't build the St. Thomas Church that had burned in 1905, but they could rent a space. And these spaces were all over, especially lower Manhattan, but also, uh, but also throughout the city. And so we can go um, to, um, uh, 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 we can go to uh, uh, Harlem in the 1930s, and they continue this kind of rental space continued. And here we have uh, a picture of, Pil of of Reverend Eldon Johnson standing in front of his rental space at 274. Good question. We don't know what street this was located on. So we know the, the house number, so to speak, but we don't know the street because the photographer who was a, a named Lucien Egner, who was a French immigrant uh, photographer, whose um, photograph, who was a famous uh, photographer, well-known photographer, among, among other things, he photographed Haile Selassie uh, when he came to New York City. And if you want to look up any photographs of Lucien Egner, you'll always find a picture of the of the Ethiopian emperor, so to speak, Haile Selassie. Well, he also took pictures of New York City. And these are located, these, these photographs have fortunately been given to the Bonnicky Library at Yale. And that's how I got this beautiful print uh, of his of his um, of his of his church, even though Agner did not write on the back uh, where what street this might be on. Uh, but here we are going to uh, here we have the same minister, and notice if you will, let's, let's go back. Notice the uh, visuals. Uh, the person, the person, uh, a minister holding a Bible in his hand with his hand, with his left hand and his right hand upraised. All right. Now notice here what's happened to the visuals. Now the visual has been moved. The nice thing about renting is that uh, you could have better quarters. And here, uh, Reverend uh, Reverend uh, Johnson is has uh, seems to have moved up a little bit. In the in the mission in the uh, in the storefront church world, he's renting a, what appears to be a larger um, a larger facility, and and uh, the photograph was taken by the famous uh, women's photographer Berenice Abbott, and the photograph is at the New York City Public Library, which is where I got this illustration from, and this is at 25 East 132nd Street taken in 1936, again by Berenice Abbott. And just to show you how both, both easy and difficult uh, this figuring out who these people were and whatnot, uh, the only thing we know about the Reverend, um, the, uh, the Reverend Johnson is that it comes from the writing on the back of the photograph that Berenice Abbott made uh, and uh, a little bit in her, in the diary that she kept because, because the minister, neither the minister nor the, ch nor the church show up in any kind of, in any Harlem, well, the Harlem newspapers have been digitized, so it's easy to find things in there, and he doesn't show up anywhere. We don't know anything about him. We don't know what happened to him before. We don't know what happened to him afterwards. We're presuming that the first picture that you saw uh, was taken before uh, the Berenice Abbott photograph here. But what's important is that it gives mobility. 
So that even when uh, resources are limited, uh, the church, the church, these ministers could move from place to place, and um, uh, uh, and they could um, uh, they they could uh, uh, develop um, uh, a congregation and 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 move along. All kinds of people, uh, congregations rented hotel space from the figure Emmett Fox, who was a quote, new thought leader, which was a kind of spiritualist uh, 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 view. He, he, he rented, he, he could rent the Astor, the ballroom, the main ballroom in the Astor Hotel. Or Carnegie Hall was rented out to the, to the rabbi Stephen Wise for his so-called free synagogue in which he did not charge uh, people. He accepted voluntary contributions, but he did not charge people. Or there are small rooms in hotels that were rented out to the I Am congregation, or a congregation that in the New York Times advertised itself as the Drana Group, or something called the Church of Divine Science, all rented space and advertised that rental space in the New York, in, in New York newspapers in the 19... 10s, 20s, and 30s. So that the city, in fact, was, was alive with sanctuary space, not just at St. Patrick Cathedral or at St. Thomas Church, which burned, uh, uh, or in semi, you know, here, here Reverend Johnson's rental space, but in hotel rooms. And so there, were, there was religiosity everywhere throughout the city, everywhere you went. Um, and, and some of the congregations really um, prospered. So uh, women also transformed the nature of congregational life. Women formed the vast majority of teachers in Sunday schools. And this is a, this is a photograph of Bethel AME Church in Harlem taken in 1919. And you'll see that there are 24, if, I, if you count, um, uh, I counted, so you don't have to. There are 24 women Sunday school teachers and four male uh, supervisors, and in the time when when women were not ordained in virtually in virtually in all ninety nine percent of American denominations, women nonetheless provided the muscle for many congregational activities, not least Sunday school teaching. And this was true at Bethel AME Church. It was true at St. Thomas. It was true at uh, in in the Catholic Church. Nuns typically, women religious typically outnumbered men uh, three, four to one in most churches. Moreover, Manhattan deepened its uh, its role as a Christian as a Christian publisher. This is the front page of the Christian Herald uh, from 1897. You'll see that the Christian Herald already had colorized photographs. A uh, man named a man by the name of Louis Klopsch. Uh, uh, turned the Christian, New, Christian Herald, published in New York City, into the largest Christian weekly journal published in the United States. These he sent hundreds of thousands of copies of this of this journal all across all across the country, um, and uh, uh, and uh, the publishing world. Uh, there were there were uh, particular publishers. Uh, uh, who um, uh, became specialists in New York City, uh, Fleming H. Ravel and George Duran, who had published uh, some of the earlier uh, uh, modernization books, but also Dodd Mead and Harper and Macmillan also discovered the wonders of, of publishing uh, religious books. And they became, they were all published in New York City. Or there was the Catholic World or the Jesuit Magazine America, or the official Catholic director, all published out of New York City, uh, became, New York was famous for its multiplicity of Jewish newspapers uh, in the, in, from, from the 1880s to uh, 1980. There were still, in 1918, there were still 50 New York City, Jewish newspapers published in the city. And the city became famous for its, Jew, for its Jewish fiction, not only by the, in Yiddish, by the author Shalom Aleichem, but even critical fiction like Abraham Kahn's The Rise of David Levinsky, published in 1917. The result was that by the 1920s, Manhattan became the nation's 
most formidable uh, 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 spiritual hothouse. And it had enormous, uh, uh, enormous range of distinguished figures. Here's Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, famous for writing Moral Man and Immoral Society in 1932 and the Nature of Destiny of Man. And this is the, the, the photograph that Time magazine used to, to put on its cover. And you can see just how, how studiously serious he was. Or there's the figure Paul Tillich. And I love this picture because it's, it's taken from uh, a photographer's named Philippe Holzman's Jumpology series in which he took pictures of famous figures uh, and all jumping. And this is, uh, uh, Paul Tillich wrote The Courage to Be and the Dynamics of Faith. And he's famous for elucidating the notion that religion was the ground of being. And it, that was a phrase that, that it was enormously influential in American religiosity in the 1960s. Or there's Jacques Maritain, who you may never have heard of. The Europe's on the right. He's on the right with Rabbi Simon Greenberg uh, taken. This is a later picture taken in 1940. He was in New exile in New York City uh, from 1941 to 1944. He was Europe's most famous uh, Catholic philosopher of the 20th century. And he's the person who is responsible for the United Nations Statement on Human Rights. He argued as a Catholic that we are all human and we all have rights and we are all born in, in the nature of, of, of God's view and we are all dignified by those human rights. Or there's a figure of Abraham Heschel and you'll see him on the right here marching in Selma in 1965. Um, and... Um, uh, he was the most already the most famous rabbi in America before he marched in Selma. Uh, he 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 wrote um, in, in enormously he was enormously influential as an author. Or there's Joseph Soloveitchik sitting next to the blackboard here, who was who who was the person responsible for the creation of what's called modern orthodoxy. And he wrote a book called The Lonely Man of Faith that he wrote in the 1940s, but it remained in manuscript until 1965. And here he's given the, giving the first shur for Jewish women, which is the first kind of talk that he gave for Jewish women uh, in, in uh, uh, 1977 at Yeshiva. And uh, then there's Dorothy Day and a Mordecai Kaplan and the Powells, Adam, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., and sort of notoriously, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And then we'll conclude with uh, Norman Vincent Peale. And notice how he's advertised. He's advertising a famed New York pastor. He doesn't say famed Chicago pastor or famed, or, or famed Los Angeles pastor or famed rural pastor. He's, you know, he's they're advertising his New York character. So all of this simply means that by the time we come up to uh, the 19, by the 1950s, New York City was unparalleled in the degree to which it had provided a theological resource for Christianity, for Judaism, for Protestantism, for Catholicism, all three religious uh, traditions in America prospered out of the regrowth, the renaissance of religion that, served, that took over from the crises of the 1880s and made New York, gave New York City the kind of spiritual vitality that would distinguish it uh, in, by, the mid, by the middle years of the 20th century. So that's what I have to say. And uh, when we come then to, uh, to, to St. Thomas, which was reconstructed uh, over a 10-year period and reopened uh, between 1913 and 1916. This is part of the renaissance of the religion in the city. So I thank you very much for uh, listening to me this morning. And uh, uh, I know you'll have a lovely morning of worship. Thank you. Mute. Can you? Yes. So, uh, John, I am immensely grateful for your uh, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, lecture and today. To me, um, it's uh, it was absolutely essential to introduce a series of lectures 
on the history of St. Thomas by having really a sense of the context, historical, social and religious context uh, um, at this turning point of the history of uh, our community. Um, and you have uh, provided brilliantly. I have to say that most of the applications to the history of St. Thomas will be made uh, further down the line. So Inge Rice will talk about uh, the role of women in St. Thomas. Francis Bluin is going to talk about the social outreach of uh, St. Thomas. Um, so we are going to see um, more uh, specifically uh, the role which St. Thomas played in the context you have um, so eloquently um, described. I can also say something which really touches me, particularly in in your work, in from your book and from your uh, lecture today, is that uh, we should not think that the problems we have today are new. Uh, we are in a context which um, of uh, intense secularization, where we have the impression that religion is becoming irrelevant. Uh, the numbers uh, seem to be um, uh, diminishing, and yet at the same time is nothing new. Uh, Christianity in New York has faced the same challenges in the past, and it has been able to reinvent itself to um, take advantage, uh, to embrace uh, the challenges uh, successfully, the challenges which the city um, uh, presents for, for us. So thank you so much, John, for your um, talk. And thank you to all of you who have um, joined. A recording uh, of the lecture will be available um, later today or tomorrow, uh, and I will send it to all of you. And I will send to you also reminders about the uh, future lectures in the series of um, Bicentennial Historical Lectures of St. Thomas. Thank you and have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye.